intergalactic corporate war. That is the constant and unfortunate reality where your character, Trent Hawkins, has to live. His home is in the Tyrian sector, which is at the very center of the ongoing conflict. As a fighter pilot working for the GenCore Tech Alliance, you're constantly sent from one life-threatening mission to the next to keep your homeland from the clutches of the evil Microsoft company. What kind of missions? How about destroy a fleet of aircraft by yourself? Or wipe out an orbital platform by yourself? Or stop a planet from exploding by killing a gargantuan lava monster inside it. You guessed it, by yourself. I'm glad the responsibility isn't too much to handle or anything like that. To prevent getting too far ahead of ourselves, we should start by taking a look at what kind of a game Tyrion 2000 actually is. The original version of this game called Tyrion was originally a marketing title that was made in 1995 for PC-DOS, mostly to promote or tease another future title called Pretzel Pete. Pretzel Pete was supposed to be a game where you play as a pretzel delivery man and fight against Baker Bob and his man-eating pretzels. I think the game developers were simply way too hungry when they came up with that idea, but apparently that game has been released too. I researched into it a bit, but got too scared to continue as I read more about it. Ah, oh get me out of here. Tyrion 2000 however is an improved version of the original Tyrion, and one heck of a masterpiece scrolling shooter game, which I played for the first time a whopping 20 years ago. Since then I've kept coming back to it every two or three years for a nice short treat. It's not a terribly long game to finish, at least talking about the main campaign and its five episodes. What does a scrolling shooter game mean anyway? Well, basically your ship is locked to moving inside the borders of your screen, but the background or the scenery keeps rolling forwards at a predetermined speed that you cannot change. Some scroller games are viewed from the side, hence the term side-scroller, but this one is viewed from top to bottom, or sky to ground if you prefer. If you move toward the bottom of the screen it can be considered slowing down, and if you move up to the top of the screen it can be considered speeding up. Side to side movements are your main tool for dodging incoming attacks, but you can never escape the confines of the screen. You get bombarded with ships, bullets, lasers and all manners of lethally dangerous attacks pretty much non-stop. They're always preset for each mission, so enemies will always show up in the exact same position at the exact same time for every attempt at a stage. Things are gonna get super busy, but luckily you can do much more than just dodge. Your ship is equipped with a front and a rear weapon, as well as two sidekick weapons. You can change any of your aforementioned weapons free of charge in between missions. When you destroy enemies and complete missions, you start to accumulate money. Weapons and their upgrades have a cost, but if you switch to a new weapon, you are refunded all the money you spent on the previous one. This is great, because if you end up getting blasted into a million pieces over and over again in some mission due to having the wrong kind of layout, you can experiment with the available weapons for that mission and find something that works. The array of weapons is pretty humongous, but only a few of the weapons are available per mission. Once you buy a weapon, however, you can keep it until you change away from it. Some weapons will appear precisely once during the entire game and its dozens of missions. If you change away from it between future missions, you will never see it again. So, let's have a look at some of the weapons, but not from too close by, obviously. These are no small pew pew guns, but more like huge kaboom boom blasters. Let's start off from the smallest available weaponry. The most basic front weapon is the Pulse Cannon, which simply shoots energy projectiles in a straight line towards the front in a nice wide row. The Multi Cannon has a wider spread, and the Vulcan Cannon has a faster rate of fire and damage output, which is good for taking out targets that appear in front of you suddenly. In the beginning, regardless of which weapons you pick, you'll probably not be able to destroy absolutely everything on each level. 
How about some of the rear weapons you can access early on? There are the heavy guided bombs which fire out the back of your ship, home in on enemies but take a while to reach them, making them pretty useless against those really quick enemies. The sonic wave is cool for two reasons. First off it's pretty awesome looking, and second of all it has two different modes. One where the waves are targeted in front of you, and one where they are fired to the side and back directions. In some missions you'll need a lot of frontal firepower, and in other missions you'll really need that back and side damage output. Let's not forget the sidekick weapons, which come in a variety of types too. Mini missiles, for example, have a limited ammo, pack a big punch with a wide spread, and while you're not firing them, they recharge very slowly. Quite a few of the side weapons simply add an extra stream of frontal aimed bullets with no ammo limit. We'll get a look at the more advanced type of weapons as we go along, but first let's take a look at what exactly we're shooting at. Simplest enemies are incoming ships that fire shots at you or attempt to ram you. You can oftentimes guess how dangerous an enemy is based on their size, but there are exceptions. Oh holy hell, I'm Swiss cheese! Some of the enemy ships are straight up impossible to destroy, so you're just forced to dodge them. There's also ships that fly in formations, making the action on screen pretty hectic to keep up with. In a lot of the levels there are platforms on the ground beneath you. Various tanks, structures and enemies on rails fire shots at you, but they can be destroyed too. I like the fact that oftentimes they've constructed blocker structures that hide the dangerous guns behind them. In some stages the environment is dangerous too, and you might be destroying incoming asteroids or literally fighting fire with fire. There's effects as well like extreme heat and cold, or darkness, but they're only harmful in a visual sense, making it harder to see what is happening. Destroyed enemies might drop extra cash you can grab, and sometimes you'll have to choose between some extra income or taking a better route to avoid danger. You'll also have to consider the fact that the more enemies you destroy, the more money you get. Oftentimes it's better to destroy more enemies than pick up the small bonus cash items. You might have noticed that you can actually take a few hits before you blow up, and that's thanks to your hull armor and shield generator. These are also items you can buy better substitutes for, and by the end of the game you can really take a huge amount of punishment, which is great, because the stages are quite a bit more busy. If you want to get really in depth, in addition to their armor rating, some of these ship types have special abilities that can be activated by pressing a key combination. But you'll have to visit old Google for the combo, since the game doesn't really tell them to you right away. One more important piece of machinery you can swap out is the generator. This is the power unit that provides power for your weapons and replenishes your shields. Some weapons are really energy hungry, and if you upgrade them too much, they'll drain your generator power, preventing your shields from recharging. See, it's a surprisingly tactical game. You can also find these special weapons dropped by certain enemies or hidden inside structures on planets. They range from straight up extra firepower to bullet repelling or cash drop attracting auxiliary items. There's a lot of cool planets, and most of them have awesome rockin' music themes. Here we go, let's do a tour of some of the iconic planets in the game. There's Savara, the fully militarized planet with a massive air fleet. Deliani, the city-covered planet with lots of surface warfare to dodge and destroy. The forest and grassland-covered planet of Torm. Watch out for the dragons! The writhing, alien-filled planet of Gygis. Hey, does anyone speak Guy Geese? The frost covered ginormous planet of Kamanis.
the deserts and mountains of Ixmukane, with sprawling underground cavern networks. Also the home planet of an incredibly advanced race of aliens called the Zika, long since extinct. And of course the idyllic forested planet of Tyrion itself, which is under a constant massive terraforming, with large floating rock formations filling the skies due to gravity testing. In between missions you can read data cubes that you collect from destroyed enemies that unfold the plot of the game or help you find out some extra information about these cool planets for example. Now how far does the game go? By the end of it you're the solo savior of several star systems, thwarter of a greedy galaxy-wide super corporation and stopper of a cult based on fruit worship? Wait what? Yeah, this game has some pretty far-fetched spin-off stuff. This must be somehow related to that pretzel game. Okay, so Zinglon is apparently the god of fruits, ale and other edible things and there are several missions where you fight against hordes of fruit-based ships. You can even acquire the powerful super carrot ship for yourself. Whoa, this is some trippy dippy stuff right here. And if this isn't trippy enough, you can fire the game up on December 24th to trigger an easter egg. The game will let you know that Christmas has been detected and swap certain weaponry to Christmas decorations and stuff. Wow, they really freestyled some of this stuff, like in one world there's bubbles. Well, points for originality. This is science fiction after all. I'm going to go ahead and yield to the fact that a lot of this game's appeal for me is nostalgic, since I've originally played it at such a young age. But that's one of the main reasons why this game made it to the top 100 list. It has easily stuck with me for all these years. Also, game mechanically speaking, a lot of the more modern games of this genre haven't really moved forward that much, at least in ways that I would prefer. This isn't going to be the last scroller game on this list, so keep an eye out for more similar action coming up. I hope more games of this genre pop up, with solid stories and atmosphere, and especially interesting new gameplay mechanics. Hey, who knows, maybe Tyrion 2000 still stands as a gem among scroller shooters in years to come. It's time to roll in dock this fighter ship and leave Trent to enjoy a well-earned holiday until it is time to save the universe again.